I V M. Before you listen to this episode of the Seen and the Unseen, I have a recommendation for you. Do check out Pulya Bazi, hosted by Saurabh Chandra and Pranay Kotesane, two really good friends of mine. Kickass podcast in Hindi. It's amazing. I grew up in the 1980s and 1990s when the state of the media looked very different from today. Everyone got their news from a handful of mainstream newspapers and magazines and TV stations, and while there may have been some biases here and there, there was by and large a consensus on the truth. All of us lived in the same world, but that world has changed. The media is fragmented. We all get our news and facts from different sources, and there is no longer that consensus. We can all choose the reality we wish to inhabit and can find supporting facts from it, whether those facts are true facts or alternative facts, as the lingo now goes. We can all choose to form our own echo chambers, and we can all choose to live in different worlds. In all of this, what does it mean to be a journalist? Are we all just suppliers fulfilling the demands of a particular segment of the marketplace or do we have a dharma that goes beyond that Welcome to the seen and the unseen our weekly podcast on economics politics and behavioral science please welcome your host Amit Varma Welcome to the scene of the unseen. In today's episode, I'm going to be talking about the state of the media, a subject I covered in an earlier episode with my friend Prem Panikkar. My guests today are Siddharth Bhatia, founder editor of The Wire, the outstanding independent online site at thewire.in, and Peter Griffin, my old friend, uh, who now works as a senior editor at The Hindu. But before that, a brief commercial break. Like me, are you someone who loves fine art but can't really afford to have paintings by the artists you like hanging on your walls? Well, worry no more. Head on over to indiancolors.com. Indian Colors is a company that licenses images of the finest modern art from some of the best artists in India and adapts them into objects of everyday use. These include wearable art like stoles and shrugs, home decor like cushion covers and table runners, and accessories like tote bags. This allows art lovers to actually get fine art into their homes at an accessible price, and artists get royalties on sales just like authors do. What's more, Indian Colors now has an exciting range of new products including fridge magnets with some stunning motifs and salad bowls and platters made of mango wood. Their artists include luminaries like Babu Xavier, Vasvo Xvasvo, Brinda Miller, Dilip Sharma, Shruti Nelson and Pradeep Mishra. They accept bulk orders for corporate and festival gifting, but even if you want to buy just for yourself or a friend, head on over to indiancolors.com. That's colors with an O U. And if you want a 20% discount apply the code IVM20 that's IVM for IVM podcast IVM20 for a 20% discount at indiancolors.com Welcome back to the scene in the unseen uh, Siddharth and Peter welcome to the show Hi Amit lovely to be here Thank you Amit it's been a while coming but I'm happy I'm here Siddharth uh, you were mentioning earlier when we were chatting before the show that you started working in 1976 That's right What brought you into journalism So um one story that i give out is that uh, jobs uh, employment in those days was difficult for a uh, generalist graduate uh, uh the services were obviously one option um and i was not good enough for it and nor was i interested quite honestly um the state bank of india probationary exam <laughs> was the other and um, banking uh, did not excite me so really by and large uh, the chances uh, of getting a proper job employment was uh, difficult the economy was growing a bit slowly and there was the emergency so things uh, were uh, ironically joining uh, you know as a journalist during the emergency was a look like a very uh, counterintuitive uh, decision but um, i got to know that there were some jobs going uh, for trainees in the free press journal which was uh, in those days a very very feisty uh, small independent minded newspaper and i applied there was a test of uh, general knowledge writing skills etc some 30 40 people applied they took three um abysmal salary Uh, but i had a kind of fondness for writing i had actually written for them as a freelancer so um, got it and that's how i began and uh, as i said it was the emergency in fact it was bang in the middle of that 19 month period um difficult times to be quite honest even me at uh, even i at my level felt those things you couldn't write so many things copy had to be sent to censors 
but um, as I now like to say, you eventually get through the darkest periods. And so, because those were the days of the emergency, and you, you know, you said you picked Free Press Journal in particular because of a feisty. Were you then also driven at the time by a sense of purpose? Like, what was journalism to you? What was your duty? You know, I don't think uh, I at least, uh, and there were hardly any training institutes. I don't think there were. Uh, I don't think that kind of mission, um, sense of mission, was driving any journalist. But you always understood a few things instinctively. First of all, the emergency had made even uh, largely apolitical types into political animals. It didn't show up in the media, but we were kind of there. And as a student in a college which was, had all these lefties hanging around, um, you know, uh, even Bombay was pretty fired up in those days. I There was a sense and... Uh, Somehow, writers and those kind of people came into one's orbit and you got to know about journalism. So, that sense was there. The sense of mission, unstated, unwritten, non-codified, was there in the newsroom and it permeated your DNA very, very rapidly. Uh, in many ways, for example, you sensed that you had to write the underdog's point of view. The citizen's voice made it to the pages of the newspapers, including the bigger ones, rather than, uh, you know, business did not dominate the economy the way it does now. So if you wrote something about big business, no harm done. Business sections were small. There were hardly any papers. You covered trade unions. Um, again, I wish to make this a special point. Uh, the city, this city was a working class city at that time. Strong trade unions, mill workers unions. So you covered them. You went to their press conference. The railway strike had just happened in 74. So it was, so it came in that, uh, not that you were a activist. None of us were allowed to be activists. Uh, but you realized that you needed to get common voices into the pages of the paper. So I suppose if you want to term it as a mission, uh, that gets in. The mission, of course, uh, you mentioned the truth. I don't think that was our mission. Our mission was to get the facts right. Right. I always say, leave the truth to those guys in the Himalayas. <laughs> get your facts right. And I think we have started playing fast and loose with facts. Siddharth, when did you see this changing? In two or three different ways, the changes have been coming. One of the big changes was, this will sound very unconnected in the beginning, but uh, when salaries started going up. Oh, okay. Uh, in the 80s, um, journalists, a better class of educated journalists came in, magazines sprung up, and uh, businessmen started investing, a magazine which were glossy came up. So there was a demand for journalists uh, from uh, publications. There was a lot of movement around. And when salaries started going up, two things happened. One is that the old wage board system uh, stopped and the contract system came in. And the contract system allowed you to get really handsome salaries, no longer controlled by a central uh, agency. Um, the second thing that happened is that... Um, Journalists started becoming part of the establishment because now they were getting paid better. They were wearing better clothes. They were moving around in circles. Business journalism had come in. So your journalists started thinking that, you know, they were on equal terms with big business, etc. When that happens, you come close to those people you are writing about. And really, honestly, journalists shouldn't have too close friends from anyone in the establishment, political, economic, anything. Um, I'm sure you read the film press or the sports uh, media and all that. You'll rarely see critical articles because they're so close, in a sense, embedded. The same thing with politics and the same thing with business. So that was one shift. The other shift came uh, when uh, in the 90s, um, this new concept came of uh, invitation price. Um, I am sorry I'm taking up too much time. But the invitation price of a publication, uh, I got my morning paper for two rupees. One rupee, actually, when it began. This was a Murdoch formula. Uh, if I'm getting it at one rupee, and the cost of production is nine rupees, 
who subsidizes the rest the advertiser the yes. advertiser the advertiser subsidize uh, 80 85 90% of your price goes to show that the advertiser has control over 80 to 90% of your revenue and therefore your space and your thought process and your decision making process so large organizations and everyone says bennett coleman started doing it but the fact of the matter is bennett did it most successfully and the others jumped in as they have jumped in with media net as they have jumped in with other things paid uh, news and all that kind of thing uh to be quite honest sometimes if you read the times of india today uh you get a far more comprehensive picture of what's happening in the city in the country and all that because they've also invested in people and that you know that core strength hasn't disappeared but a lot of people have given that up and started introducing these uh, as a columnist for the times of india i'm kind of glad, glad you said that but this shift therefore basically what happened was that you're saying newspapers instead of producing journalism for readers started producing readers for advertisers readers yes, became yes, the product in yes. manner of speaking people have said publicly we are an ad platform right uh, this is a uh, echoes what uh, i think it was beaver brook or somebody who said that you know news is what you put and and was this driven by compulsion or greed like did the earlier model not work for them to have to do this or was this simply well look more, at it this uh, way if you are chugging along very well and you are happy with a 40 crore turnover the model working okay because you are making a profit of 5 crores or 6 crores or whatever the model is working you are a profitable organization influence is fantastic everyone says salam to the bosses mm. but if you go from 40 crore turnover to 250 then 500 which model are you going to choose right as a as a businessman who you know you I mean, have to do right talking, to your shareholders you're talking at this moment i in the 80s i remember a multinational chief executive had once said to a few of us your publication making more money than i am in this country and i have been here for 100 years so um once that happened the journalist became the uh, tool or the uh, vehicle to deliver content and to give those this now how does it show up in real terms it shows up in the following way the morning when a family person you know husband wife whatever gets up reads uh, the newspaper has a cup of coffee is about to tuck into the serial and there is a photograph of somebody bleeding on the front page and that day either his or somebody else's product is in the solar space the company is not going to like it because that's off putting so you start feeding pablum and you know keeping <laughs> the reader happy the advertiser happy and generally creating this mythical sweet glowing world news naturally takes a hit and not all money gets uh, funneled into news gathering because some idiot will want to go to a village and come back with a story of an atrocity right and i know i'm simplifying it but my bigger point is these things started having it's a long process what we are seeing today has been speeded up in the last 4 years but it's a long process of devaluing the idea of good journalism Be a good time for me to turn to you, Siddharth. Just sort of been talking about how through the seventies until the nineties, the incentives for journalists changed. First of all, the incentives changed because uh, they were no longer the producing the main product, which was the journalism, which would you know attract readers to buy the newspaper. But the readers were the product, and they had to sort of uh, you know everything had to be therefore done at the behest of advertisers and so on. And this process became exacerbated, so to say, when the business model changed. Where instead of relying on subscriptions, you start relying on advertisers. advertising because it's far more profitable now as i was you know we were chatting earlier while we were on our way to the studio i consider you a bit of an an anomaly because even though you work as a senior editor in an old media organization uh, i've always thought of you as someone who is right at the cutting edge of new uh, media you know i've known you from the time we were early bloggers and uh, you did a lot of innovative stuff with new media such as you know crowdsourcing relief at the time of the cloud burst and um, uh, later on the terrorist attacks in uh, mumbai and so on and so forth um so you've you've kind of seen the changing state of the media from up close uh when did you begin to feel that in some way journalism and the media were fundamentally changing because of technology so i think i saw these changes starting off in the 90s when 
before journalism. Okay, I was a journalist first, a cub in a magazine, then I went off into advertising and spent years there, became a creative director and then got disillusioned. And But during that time is when I saw the first elements of technology changing, where, you know, I had to do the kind of things like we were doing the first digital artworks. Uh, I My advertising career went through the age of manual artworks where you were assembling stuff on pasteboard to having fights with the studio on saying that you could do digital far easier and they were seeing, you know, unable to. I made presentations in the office that said, here is the price of an email account. Wow. Here is the cost of a peon. If you can ferry your artworks via email, so to speak, hmm. you will be saving this much money. So I've come from that. So I, so it's a sort of long-winded way of answering your question of seeing the media change, but I saw it from a different way. I saw it from uh, the enemy camp, so to speak, from the advertising agency point of view. And the big lessons I took from advertising is that when we realized, this was I was fascinated listening to Siddharth all this time, we were the interruption in advertising. Uh, they were consuming it for the media. And we had to try and make our way there and be interesting because no one bought a newspaper for the ads. At least that was my perception. Though I'm learning differently from what you guys have been talking about right now. But, uh, you know, no one put on the television to watch ads, except weirdos like me who were fascinated by advertising and put on the television just before Ramayan because that's when you saw the biggest chunk of ads all together and you could see everything all together. That's what made me want to become a copywriter. But I saw that change happening as the internet came in and technology came in. I would have had a different perspective on it, I guess, if I had been involved more with print at that time, because I was looking at it from the advertiser side. And so I would not have seen or remarked on the changes that Siddharth just talked about, because we were the other end of it at that point. I started writing in the press again, freelance a little bit here and there in the mid 2000s, mainly features. I've always been a features guy rather than a news guy. And... I saw the process of change happening in multiple ways, in the way news was gathered, in the way you could produce news, all of that. I don't have much of a view on uh, ways to pay for it and what it was and what it isn't uh, that was educative in the sense of that you could have been making money purely off your subscribers and it was purely because of the dropping of prices to sort of kill the market for your competitors that caused the change was something that had not registered on my head. So thank you for that. But uh, I guess... I mean, going back, for example, I remember one of the uh, moments where we also got to know each other was when the tsunami struck. Yeah. And I went through the coast of Tamil Nadu, basically live blogging it in yeah. a sense, which uh, uh, sort of made my blog at the time, India and Kurt, just sort yeah. of explode into everyone's uh, consciousness. And what you did at that time was you put together a very interesting system. I don't know if you noticed what Peter was doing in those days, which was that you collated SMSs from people all across the affected areas and you put them on one blog so people could get real updates and people could, you know, if, if, yeah. I, I forget what you called that. So we did a number of different things. Uh, in fact, the guy who came up with those thoughts on using text and whatnot is a chap called Tarun Rampasar uh, yeah. from the uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah. And uh, as he has pointed out and others have pointed out, it was Twitter way before Twitter. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I don't think he's got enough credit for that. Mm. But uh, no, we, so we did a number of things. So like you were doing it in a strange, using your blog, using digital to do the old-fashioned reporter's job. Yeah. And what Except we, in real time. So you're not beholden to the news cycle. Exactly. You're using digital. Mm. This is what I... Yeah. Coming to that. Which is... Now you were not bound by anything, but you were doing it the old-fashioned way. Right? Right. Your method of delivery and your schedule and everything was now wide open. Exactly. What we were doing was... So the SMSs and all that were part of it. We were collating information for a world that wanted to help. So... We were, most of us were in India. There were a few people abroad as well. And we were putting together that information in a way that could be useful for... There was a surge of goodwill. People wanted to help. We were able to channel that. We were relying on stuff that, you know, people like you did who went out there and talked. We had this diverse set of networks, people in the NGO world, people who were journalists, feeding us information, uh finding out which are the reliable organizations. So we were doing something in a sense, the kind of task we did was not available to be able to do that in real time before. Uh, and we became an aggregator 
off a variety of other things and became a channel in that sense. So that in a way also, I remember uh, Ashok Malik talking about it where he said that this was a case of actually an innovation here that had then been exported to other parts of the world. Things that we did at that time, Google's Pe- People Finder, I am told eventually evolved from something that some of the team did there when Hurricane Katrina was happening. Right. Uh, one of my, our collaborators from the Tsunami blog sitting here in Bombay, another one uh, who was in Kuwait if, at that point and another woman in London uh, were operating a call center for people seeking help in Houston using a free Skype number and so on and so forth. So I'm saying the technology kept widening out. What, what we did, what, what a whole lot of us were doing, I think at various points, was looking at things and saying, okay, this is a blog. A blog is meant to be a diary. Why does it have to be a diary? It can do X, Y, Z things. And you were repurposing as you went along. And what was exciting about uh, those times was that suddenly the means of production was open to everyone. Absolutely. And it was at times like this where, uh, you know, you're not relying on mainstream media. You're getting important information out there in real time. There are people curating it for you. And uh, even as a regular blogger during those times, this was one of the most exciting things of blogging. And I always used to think that, fine, there'll be a lot of good content. There'll be a lot of bad content. But you let the people figure it out. You let the markets operate. That's fine. You know, everything will find its niche. And it was tremendously exciting. And at that time, there seemed there's no real downside to this. But then what started happening was... And I still maintain all of this is a net positive and thank God for this technology. But then what started happening was that this led to what I referred to in the introduction, uh, the fragmentation of the media, where suddenly you're not relying, where mainstream media essentially falls apart in terms of being the one place that people go to for their news and for their views of the world. And instead, uh, they can pretty much... Uh, find something that caters to however they want to see the world. They can form their own echo chambers. They can live in their own little constructed, uh, separated worlds. And what you see today is sort of an extreme version of that where, you know, so many people who get their news from WhatsApp forwards and, um, you know, we are inundated in an age of fake news. And uh, to me, there seems no way around it because this is, uh, you know, all of this content is put out freely by people expressing themselves and you don't want to fight their uh, uh, free expression. And at the same time, there is an organic market for it, which is saying that we don't give a damn about what you think the facts might be. This is what we want to believe. How do we get past this? So a lot of interesting stuff here, especially I was paying extra close attention to the idea of leveraging uh, digital and the one big takeaway from many of the things you said was that means of production now are a little uh, democratic, democratized. Um, and it is a net positive because I am now increasingly finding out that Twitter, for example, what we call Twitter, but the Twitter verse, the, that whole is a far more independent voice collectively uh, than uh, the mainstream media. And in India, uh, I can say this with some confidence that the mainstream media is breathing its last uh, if they go on like this. So let's, um, I want to stick to this point for a minute. For example, uh, TV in India is dead. News TV in India is dead. News TV in India is not just echo chambers, but it is echo chambers for extraordinarily small demographics, uh, all of whom, While knowing that it is, uh, you know, they have confirmation biases which are being met, they know that, um, you know, the screaming at nine o'clock about, um, you know, how awful the opposition is, uh, etc. They know that it is meeting those biases. For example, let me put it this way. Does anybody who follows any of these noisy channels want their son to become that? And say, when you grow up, I want you to become this. I think there are more and more children nowadays being named or not. I think that would be an aspiration for a lot of My people. My point is, <laughs> no, everyone no, no, no. has an instinctive understanding. Right. But this formula and uh, Fox TV in India, uh, in, the, in the US has been successful for a long time. But this formula has a self-limiting 
But when you say news TV is dead, if I may ask you to elaborate and we can uh, numbers. stick on this point, the numbers. Yes. So you're not saying from a point of view of some journalistic ideal, but commercially they are dead. Yes, because uh, look at the investment you're putting hmm. in. A simple channel with hmm. the, you know bureaus and equipment. Equipment is getting miniaturized, but people have not switched to it yet in a big way. Right. You still have to pay satellite fees. Right. You still have to pay the cable wala in this country. Right. And is a resultant polarization uh, a result of that? Because it's a race to the bottom now. It's yes, just a yes, race to course. get eyeballs. No. So it's as a look. The I don't want to go into deep detail about it, but if you were to do a, even a cursory research, the set top boxes are more in Ahmedabad than in the entire northeast. Mm. Where are you going to pitch your argument to? Right. You're not interested in the northeast. Firstly, getting people there. Secondly, getting people all excited. Thirdly, what will the advertisers say? Mm. So if it's skewed like this, commercially. You're already geared your model around that. Then you have set up 200 crores to set it up, while there are 437 other news channels. So you've got your small universe, and maybe you're making money. How long? Government changes. Are you going to change? Are you still going to be in the same mode? All those journalistic factors will feed into the larger economic reality. It's about economic. Right. The larger publications are thriving, doing very well. Literacy is growing up. uh increasing the newspapers themselves have solid revenues and it's um, you know they have not totally sold themselves down the river you can still read a newspaper but uh worldwide the bigger newspapers so many have shut down uh, so as this kind of digital world and technology world i'm a dinosaur but the person who's now 28 already consuming in quotes the news from those kind of sources is reading everything on mobile i don't think anyone gets five newspapers at home i still do but they are not going to so your sense is eventually as the trend grows even the times of india hindustan times or hindu they are in all... the long run they will have to uh, either modify, adapt or die uh, adapt perhaps have a smaller circulation up their journalism game maybe open new bureau consolidate many papers will come together 2005 when i came back to india after living abroad for a while five newspapers started in this city within six months dna mera hindustan times mint and um, one more i, I remember that. yeah you right? were dna right ah uh, yeah mm. uh, dna's budget in those days marketing budget you remember those ads yeah, yeah. was humongous hindu was coming into bombay etc so uh, the mirror was the times reaction mm. now those headaches are gone journalists are losing jobs newsrooms are tiny um so it's going to have a commercial impact it's a myth to think that setting up a digital site is actually quite a you know modest investment it is not um because uh, even with those modest investments you still have to invest in people and people are very very expensive news gathering is very very expensive but it allows us to be nimble sharing is name of the game some freelancer from somewhere will pop up high quality and deliver a uh, lot of journalists are getting fed up i want middle east coverage i have a middle east site whom i have never met in my life i shake hands across the digital world they say take our stories so my coverage is going to get beefed up uh so uh, uh that's going to happen nimbleness uh television the first few companies ndtv etc were nimble operations started by independent uh, they didn't come from times of india the times of india's first foray into television was a flop hindustan times had home tv it was a flop uh you guys had uh, something in the hindu you know but raghav came out of nowhere and started this you know he's an accountant and the same thing is happening with digital So what at the moment we are doing and several others are doing is bringing strong journalism uh, values. You were talking about how you live blog. You may be an irresponsible person, but uh, filtration is critical. The process is because there are several fake news wala who will tell you not a single Christian has died in this because Christian missionaries are paying for their Kerala it happened. Ah. Uh, I think people want to read um they love the taste of chutney and they want their chutney but they can't live on it so hygiene 
uh, news hygiene, um, nutrition, etc. will have to come in the game. And uh, some will start, some will die. We also lead a very financially precarious existence and all that. Journalism will thrive, whether it's a blogger bringing news and facts. As you said, we were aggregating um, just simple facts of what was happening in people's appeals. Now, Twitter does it. You can do it via Twitter and Facebook and several other platforms. But uh, media is an extremely dynamic situation at the moment. On that wonderfully hopeful note, we'll take a commercial break with the promise that we'll come back to discuss darker matters. So it's been another great week on IVM Podcast, just like it is every week. You know, if you aren't following us on social media, you should. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Send us a message. Send us a comment. You know, let us know what you think about the stuff that we're doing and the stuff that you're listening to. This week on Cyrus Says, Cyrus is joined by writer Rishali Telang. She speaks about jumping from TV to books and her memories of producing MTV Loveline. On the scene and the unseen, Amit is joined by founder editor of The Wire, Siddharth Bhatia, and senior editor of The Hindu, Peter Griffin. They discuss the current state of Indian media and the role of journalists today. This week, Indranil Guha, co-founder of Finpec, talks to Anupam on Pesa Vesa about Alpha SIPs. Last week on Know Your Kanun, lawyer and host Ambarana took us through the history and scope of Section 497 and the time when adultery was first recognized as an offense. On the Kinetic Living podcast, Urmi spoke to IVM's co-founder Kavita Rajwade about her love for functional training, food, and the morning workout routine that she strictly follows. And again, guys, I just really want to remind you, you know, I mean, like the best way to spread the word about podcasting is you. You're our ambassadors. Please go out and tell a friend. Ask them to listen to something that you have enjoyed and that you think that they would enjoy as well. And with that, let's move on with the show. Welcome back to The Scene in the Unseen. I'm chatting with Siddharth Bhatia and Peter Griffin. Uh, so, Siddharth, when we were on the break, you were just talking about how you love Twitter. But isn't Twitter also a reflection with what's happening in the media to our discourse in the sense that it's incredibly polarized? What I find on Twitter is that everything has become shrill. All discourses become personalized where people don't talk to each other. They talk past each other. And often they are, you know, virtue signaling in different ways to lift their status within their own in-group. And dialogue is almost impossible. Yeah, so it's not a dialogue uh, platform, let's be honest. <laughs> uh, nor was a typical newspaper. It was not a dialogue. Uh, this, I am a great admirer of the newspaper model. So when people rubbish it to say, oh, who are these editors on high? The editors on high are people with great amount of qualifications. They have studied the subject or they expected to have studied the subject. Even what they write, forget the reporter, passes through three uh, layers. A uh, news editor can look at it and fact check and it comes out after a 24-hour cycle. So that thing that you say, there is a, you know, uh, I will not name this person, a very smart alecky media commentator, stroke, um, you know, he writes and talks about the media all over the place. Very hip, very, uh, this, who once said I was at some meeting to an audience of students that uh, the day of the editorial is over, editorial comment, because who are these bunch of old farts trying to tell you uh, what you should think? And, you know, I can kind of break it down and rubbish it, uh, but basically what I'm trying to say is filtration in a newspaper is critical. But it was not a dialogue. Letters to the editor and which got cut and very few people papers really give it much thought, uh, was no dialogue. You didn't like a piece, you lumped it. Twitter has no dialogue. But there is a chance that somebody will respond. There is that small band and world of people who will talk to you, uh, engage with you. I don't engage with anybody who trolls me at all. I block. If I don't block 10 people a day, I feel like there's something. Yeah, so you've got your mosquito swatter with you and you're swatting and that gives you great joy. Um, I stopped uh, blocking. The other day I met somebody and said, well, you blocked me and I've known him for about 30 years and I had blocked him. But socially, I was a bit embarrassed and I said, did I? I thought I was muted you. And he's Sorry. listening to this now, so your cover is blown. <laughs> so, uh, sure, there are those. But I welcome criticism. Um, there have been times when uh, mistakes have been pointed out. I welcome that. People have said, hey, I can't read your website. I welcome that. People have said, you know, why are you biased in the favor of X or against Y? Uh, if it, it looks like an intelligent person, the profile says, you know, reasonably sensible things. Followed by PM Modi. Um, that also I will 
perhaps if this comment is sensible oh but God. if she or he is a coffee snob out i don't do coffee snobs a lot of coffee snobs on their twitter but <laughs> no it's interesting talking about you but don't... i do respond yeah i engage i listen that's my feedback and what i also like to f- tell myself i must respect my twitter followers and our readers i owe it to them i am not talking down i am sharing i like to think and and what you talk about uh, you know the importance of the editor in being a filter for content if you think about it in one way all of us are our own filters that's what we use social media for like what you will find on my twitter feed will be quite different from what is on yours or on peter's because we've all already been our But own editors in terms of what we want to follow i can follow everybody and get a variety of views i'm not saying send me this thing uh, every morning yeah. which only there are people who subscribe to let's say us but they would subscribe to something that's on not us except that subscribing to a rapidly right wing lying website uh, fill in the blanks yeah right. uh because i know you have a huge audience so i don't want to get into legal issues you're, you're welcome to say whatever the hell you want but that is not uh, the yeah. counter to that is not the wire is not that exactly. the counter to the wire is to say look i re- like you but i think your views are too extreme or too not to my liking i will read something that balances so here's whatever a, it may be here's a subject i want to explore uh, how do you make money how does journalism today make money is a wire profitable if i may ask mm. or is there a part to profitability so we there is no question of profitability because we are donation led right we are a not for profit we began with uh, three uh, of us putting in uh, i i say this uh we had a lot of things lacking we had just 3 lakhs that's right. all 1 right. lakh 1 lakh 1 lakh that's right. all and uh, for months we never took a salary we worked out of each other's homes when i went to delhi i stayed with my friends they came down they stayed with me that's how we managed some old karma must have played a role because for about 10 months or 12 months we never paid people and now we do but because we just called in favors left right and center halfway through people realized this was a platform worth writing on so more people started writing after about 8 months a high net worth individual came to us and says i'd like to give you some money he was turned out to be super generous gave us 50 lakhs mm. and since then we've got money from foundations from grants and now of course we have a very active uh online donation program so uh there's no question of profit but, but you, we are always short of what we burn but here's my thing uh, you know what you just said both gives me great hope and also great despair great hope because it's wonderful to know that there are people for whom journalism is a labor of love and they will do it no matter what and you know they will fight the odds to do it like you guys started it from your homes but it also gives me despair that one has to depend on the passion of individuals and on uh, you know the magnanimity of philanthropists here and there rather and than the actually, common donor and the common donor rather than actually be able to make money from it and that makes me very sad and and my question here peter is and we were discussing this earlier is that look i think everyone who reads a wire or who reads scroll on the excellent magazine uh, or pragati my own magazine everyone who reads any of these uh, publications is paying for it they're paying for it because they're spending a certain amount of time on it time is money there's opportunity cost except there's no way for the publisher to capture that value now earlier the old school value was you bring out a newspaper readers read it you capture that through advertising that is clearly not working you know you you worked with network 18 for many years and now with the hindu advertising no longer is enough to make money of uh, digital media subscriptions really i believe the ken is doing very well and more power to them but haven't really taken off to that extent how do you make money with journalism is my question to both of you okay so you know uh it wasn't just the subscription price that kill that caused uh, the introduction price that caused problems what came up was that no one i think from the beginning learned how to deal with the internet uh because even if you were you were paying 2 bucks for your newspaper and i could get the same thing online for free uh paying the cost of my internet subscription which was pretty high at that point of, you know prices have dropped there but we got accustomed all over the world for the internet to give us stuff for free 
and if the internet didn't give us stuff for free if somebody tried to you know charge you money for it there were others who were giving it free so in a similar way that you couldn't combat the 2 rupee invitation price and keep your money because the moment someone else succumbs you have alternatives who are giving you you know your news at lower rates then the guy who's charging higher will say okay fine we don't even though that's you know a trivial amount it's the cost of a vada pav at that point or whatever it is you would still go to the cheaper alternative now the problem is i don't think any of us in the traditional media have really learned how to or what we think enough about the internet i think that in india we have had a bit of a a cushion in you we seen uh, in the more developed parts of the world newspapers closing down shutting shop slashing the sizes of their newsrooms and all of that uh in india we have a few fortunate things happening one is that we are still a poor country we are still a, la- a country with a large amount of uh, a, a large gap in literacy there are new literates coming in every day <coughs> we're not a mature market in that sense right so when new people are coming in every day they want something to consume in terms they want information they want to be able to read it and so we have growth it has given us the illusion that the media is continuing to grow because there are new people coming in and when you come in newly to literacy you're not going straight to literature right you look at functional uh, information first where do i get what is the price of x or where do i get good sales for you know find my markets for my produce find out the basic information out there and the media delivers that but we have we could have been using this time i think broadly in the indian media to figure out how to find paying models uh whether it is as uh, sidat was talking about where you've decided that your funding is going to come from philanthropists and donors or the ken model which is entirely subscription based or the hybrid models or or some other stuff we haven't thought of yet how are you going to deliver that content we should have been having these conversations and been thinking about it for years now we haven't because we've been growing in smaller and smaller uh you know jumps but we've been still continuing to grow uh the fragmentation that we were talking about all the other stuff that comes in you know the, just one little point out there we we're talking about twitter and everything and the thing is that all the twitter and early blogs and everything all the big accounts mainstream media noticed them gave them that and you know uh your credibility came from having been written about the tsunami help blog came got credibility from being featured in xyz and then the new york times picking it up and then suddenly we were world, world famous for like 5 days uh all of that stuff there's still a huge amount of power in the media is what that tells me uh things are being discussed in opposition to the media but you're still opposing that thing that's there it's still important enough to oppose so that gives me in a strange kind of way hope that enough people take enough time to combat and debunk or fight against what they see as the oppression and see of, value in it that that's the more important it's because they see value in it that they think it's important enough to counter you know even the ones who are saying this is all bloody fake news mm. uh are still taking the trouble to say that it is fake right. news okay it's worth attention and that in a strange way actually gives me hope that you still think it's important enough to fight that the the old fashioned battles are still being fought in new media kind of ways that someone with the solid credentials of siddharth and the team out there are still out there being able to deliver this stuff as so i think so this deal. does give me hope but i'll tell you where the gap is and what the dilemma is let's say that it gives both of us hope that someone like pratik sena of fault news is doing what he is doing mm-hmm. it's just magnificent which is basically right. debunking fake news all the yeah. time it also gives me great hope that he has so many followers and alt news has so many readers what worries me is that they are not supremely profitable that is sort of where the gap is and i understand that some of it is because of inertia in our mindsets like the you know a lot of newspapers sell simply because i'm used to the daily newspaper coming to my house and i just mm-hmm. don't cancel my also, subscription also they also sell because uh, uh, advertising in newspaper is also information okay it's very important to But understand do people buy that buy newspapers for advertising 40% of a newspaper buyer is because of classifieds even today oh really because okay. we don't have craigslist right uh, but a lot of people still want to buy and sell cars via that rather mm-hmm. than the digital world and um, 
you know, a large advertising display is also this uh, read by a lot of people. So mm-hmm. advertising is a critical part of the information package. Which is really interesting. So th- th- those are the two kinds of inertia I was mentioning. One is that people who wouldn't otherwise read newspapers still pay for them in one way or the other. And uh, the other one is that in the early days of the internet, no one wanted to pay for anything. Even we didn't. And part of the reason is a friction in payment. Ki who's going to give your credit card detail? How do you make micro payments happen? Most of that friction has actually gone away now. And, and you can set up systems to do it really easily. And uh, yet, uh, that model hasn't really taken off. No. So, I think uh, part of uh, your uh, answer is in your question. Uh, and that is that, uh, that I can point out several things today which were unheard of and, um, you know, people were skeptical about. Um, a lot of newspapers, even in India, are now selling their archives. You have to subscribe for the archives. I think your own newspaper, The Hindu, after seven days, you need to pay to read anything before seven days, if I'm not mistaken, or register at least. Payment is going to come. You can't read the Economic Political Weekly. A lot of people want to read it. You have to subscribe for the online version. Um, so um, everyone said nobody pays. Um, the New York Times had a huge flop when they tried to introduce payment in the early days. Then they said, okay, columnists is payment, the rest is free. Now, only three articles or five articles or whatever. And all the legacy brands around the world in every country, whether it's, uh, you know, Der Spiegel or whether it is Le Monde or whether it's The Economist, The Times in London, The Guardian not. But everywhere else, you've it's got working. to. The tide has changed. You've got to pay. Mm-hmm. Business Standard is trying it here. I don't know how successful they are, but then Business Standard's own columnists post their articles on their blog, so you are getting something. Mm-hmm. But it's going to change. It's going to definitely change. Who thought donor-led uh, news media would uh, take off? Now there are, uh, as you said, hybrid model. There are at least two or three people who said uh, they call it subscribe. So can we see the day when the Wire and Alt News are hugely successful by themselves and don't so need So uh, the, the, the model for hugely successful is, um, you know, flexible. I would say we are not going to become a 5,000 crore company anytime soon. But if I can get, say... 35% of that influence, 50% of that influence, and a piece in the wire gets the attention of policymakers, um, I think we've got it. So, you know, I would love to make 5,000 crores and probably will put 4,999 crores into news gathering. Uh, as a promoter, I don't get anything. My salary is low and my dividend zero. So there's no money for me. But uh, I would love to do it. Who would have thought that Vinod Dua long forgotten, right? resurrected by us uh, in the sense that mainstream channels wouldn't touch him, would uh, have a confirmed subscriber base on YouTube of 700,000. And that's a remarkable show. Right? 700,000 is our YouTube channel. We are people who know nothing about that world. Does he make a lot of money? Does he monetize that? Of course not. We get advertising. Yes, mm-hmm. YouTube gives us advertising. YouTube does. Um, it's very easy to become a YouTube uh, and put advertising. I mean, they're very, very cooperative. Sure. But uh, we don't have an ad manager, mm-hmm. and we don't have a we don't have a, a show sponsor on our channel, and that's because we can't afford an advertising manager. But tomorrow, when I we can afford an ad manager, that person will get sponsorships for that. I'll give you another tiny example. You know, these summits held by newspapers and all that kind of thing, right? Mm. And there are a lot of these award shows, cocktail parties, promotions, Mm. brand promotions, all kinds of innovative names. Mm. I think almost all, maybe barring a few here and there, are free events. Right. Of course, there are tickets for certain shows, Mm. certain summits and all that. We've been holding small ticketed events, small. Mm. Arun Chori talks to Karan Thapar, 800, mm. 700 people, mm. tickets sold at something like the first five rows or something, 2,000 rupees or something. Mm. We made money on it. Wow. Who would have thought? Arun Chori in Delhi. Mm. You know, so these are tiny drops in the ocean, but things do change. Um, you know, there are websites which are trying the subscription model. They may not succeed today. They may tomorrow. Some are trying the embedded uh, advertising model. Some are getting... 
So things are changing definitely. We are innovative enough. We'll figure it out. All this will work. Yes. From where you know, let's move on to from the commerce to let me ask you guys about the media climate in India. Given what's happening politically, given that there is this interplay between money and power, that uh, does affect the way the mainstream media reports on things. For example, um, you pointed out earlier that Jay Shah's case on the wire. was not reported by any of the mainstream no it was reported the next day but the emphasis was on the case that he was to file on monday morning right and no one called you for a comment um don't think anyone called and used a comment in any substantive way right. and i also i mean you know others may have got private phone calls i did not get a single call of solidarity and mm. i've been in the business for a while um so um the big newspapers reported it Uh, and you've seen with Rafal, right, right. Olan contradicts Mr. Modi's statement. Is the headline obvious? Headline it should be exactly. And it says that it sparks off a uh, you know crossfire, uh, a political crossfire in India. I was, I That's was, hardly the news. Yeah, I was shocked to see one of the headlines in one of the mainstream newspapers. I won't take the name, but we are recording this by the way on September twenty fourth, so it will come out a bit later. But it's in okay. the context yeah. of what's. Uh, Uh, yeah. going on now i'm just letting the listeners know and and does this worry you yes of course it worries me i'm a practicing professional journalist i think my duty is to my readers all the time uh you know this sounds like a grand uh, mission statement but it's there embedded in my uh, uh so um uh of course it worries me that uh, the media s- uh, state in india at the moment um as i said i'm a professional journalist I think of my reader. I'm not constantly motivated by what the reader may feel. I don't want to be second guess or second guess that reader of mine. I think she's uh, intelligent, articulate, and if she comes to us, definitely curious and eager to know what's going on. But I do instinctively, intuitively realize and understand that ultimately, all this is to bring my reader up to speed with what's happening. and when i see that reader being taken for granted with this kind of thing how many people have turned around and told you that you know we don't trust the big media anymore some have said it because it's a kind of a you know everyone says it some say it because it's not meeting their requirement but some say it because they're not getting what they think is authentic information if if we are of course called all kinds of things you know rahul gandhi is funding us and all that If we, they were funding us, we'd be in a ten times better situation. We are hand to mouth basically, but yes, it does uh, worry me. Um, you know, I when I speak to students, I'm reminded of something that I may have read years ago. By the way, I was never told about these things by any senior. There was no mission statement in my organization or anywhere else. But uh, it gets into your system. But I remember reading. I think it was H. L. Mencken who mm-hmm. said. uh you know journalism is about comforting the afflicted and affecting afflicting the comfortable, comfortable. Mm. and i think we are comforting the comfortable <laughs> and afflicting the afflicted by ignoring them but basically. that too yeah. but you know all the stuff that is appearing is about uh so and so iit topper gets this uh, salary this is kind of mollycoddling your reader with all kind of good news indian cricket is covered as though we are the greatest in the world and i'm sorry we are not um india lost england did not win alone in we lost badly um um uh, i'll end on this there's a fantastic headline in one of the papers in shekhar kapoor's film uh, elizabeth went to the oscars and uh, it's a foreign production with a foreign cast with a director who happened to be of indian ethnic origin and um, it lost in the mainstream this they got only one or uh, none uh, awards in the oscars and the headline in this paper in delhi was and the oscars goes to apartheid i mean look at the sheer idiocy about this statement you have firstly no idea what apartheid is and secondly is it racism or were there better films is the world against us i mean this sense of victimhood this sense of wanting to win all the time Victimhood and populism kind of go together. This is, I'm sorry to say, Deutschland Uber Alles all over again. You know, so I'll kind of um, uh, that a bit drastic. I'll end this episode by uh, that can't be a loss word on the subject. I'm going to end this episode by asking you guys um, one question with two parts each. 
which is what makes you hopeful and what makes you despair about the state of the media in India today. Peter, let's start with you. So hope is uh, that we're having these conversations, for instance. You work with... uh, Pragati. Pragati, which is a startup in that sense. It was a relaunch of the magazine. You're finding ways to fund it. You're sitting here and doing this podcast uh, and have been doing it for a while, have built up readership and are not making money on it. But you're doing it to build an audience. Uh, Siddharth and the team that he's working with have found ways to deliver old-fashioned journalism in new ways. And as I was saying just a few minutes ago, that people find the media still worth fighting with or against is actually makes me optimistic because there's enough power there. Those are all, uh, I see young people, there are the young people who will be happy to reproduce press releases for sure. But I've seen a huge number of young people who are still burning with that desire to go out there and tell truths find out, dig, young people in my organization, uh, interns who are willing to, you know, we had a kid in here who didn't even do a one-month internship. She interned with us for six months, doing a full-time college course just so she could get experience and for free, as in she wasn't even getting paid expenses. All these things give me optimism for the future. What makes me despair is this entire thing of this, Again, internet enabled, I guess, in some ways, the polarizations that have happened, that we will retreat and be content to have our opinions confirmed rather than challenged. You know, for me, I have always, I mean, this is doing what you, uh, I know you don't like very much, virtue signaling. But uh, for me, conversations like this are bloody interesting because I'm learning about things that I don't know anything about. And... Is going to make me sound like I'm trying to make myself look good. But I think there's there's not enough of that. That we want our opinions confirmed more than challenged. That we want to be made to feel good rather than to learn more. And all of that kind of feeds into one another. And it's sad that, as you know, as that was also just saying a little while ago, it's uh, why are people pissed off with the mainstream media? We need to do a lot of introspection on that as well. There are lots of things I think that we in the big media have not got right by any means. And that's why people were so ready to believe the worst of us. And if we don't figure those out and find ways to deal with that, and if we don't figure out how to make it commercially viable to produce good journalism, we're screwed. I hope we will. I hope we will while I'm still earning a salary in the media and, you know, I've not found some other way to make an income. But it makes me worry. So, so despair, I thought I was, um, you know, uh, spooning out the despair uh, <laughs> substantially. Uh, my despair is, um, apart from all the things I mentioned, is that uh, uh, a lot of fantastic youngsters who are coming to this profession, full of passion, full of ideas, full of willingness to do a, a work. And um, journalism schools are full, as you know but uh, are either not willing or not encouraged to uh, do walk the streets and get the story. Uh, you know, Google, mobile phone, Wikipedia, uh, one quote, formula, and there it goes. And you need bosses who say, sorry, not working. Um, so uh, when I meet a... I, we've just taken a guy uh, who will uh, go to extraordinarily remote places and come back with stories on uh, not the usual rural distress and all that, but and not even rural hope. That's the other thing. Everything should not be hope or distress, but come back with state of the ground, uh, straight of the grassroots stories, you know, bread and butter, leg work. And uh, I, if any young reporter is listening to me, I would say to her, please go out and report. When you were talking about how you travel down the coast of Tamil Nadu, you were doing old-fashioned, solid ground reporting. You could have easily, you know, sat there and kind of uh, assembled this, that and the other. So uh, I that's a professional despair that really 
uh the hope is equally kind of it's actually connected um uh, i get invited to speak to students everywhere i'm in pune day after tomorrow speaking to uh, uh at a university a large numbers turn up um i like to think that we must be doing something which wants them to connect and listen to us uh not because we are evangelists uh, i am a corporate evangelist because i am constantly looking for money but uh, we are not media evangelists at all but that gives me hope student union elections in jnu have given me hope not because the leftists won because they saw something about uniting that these opposition parties have not been able to understand so all those things give me hope you know people say oh the emergency all over again rubbish the emergency was terrible things are not good but it was terrible but what really pisses me off and despairs is that the establishment media establishment is letting down the side and its own staff and its own readers so this i would end uh, on a when i see all these small efforts popping up and when you said somebody is making money on subscriptions and all that they are not successful in a huge way uh the times of india is 180 years old but uh, by something in a few years you are going to see more and more youngsters coming in saying hey this is not working i want to start something of my own or join somewhere learn and then go out and do something on my own so on the whole i think i've been listening to you intently peter uh technology is going to be a huge driver of ideas and innovation and if those old and new worlds can be married effectively i think we are on to a damn good track that's a great note of hope to uh, end on more power to all the young people listening to the show want to make a change and more power also to my fellow old fogies here peter and siddharth thank you so much for coming you ain't no old fogie amit well <laughs> relative to he the young people who are that. going to he didn't say that he said the two old fogies i said to my fellow old fogies like i regard <laughs> oh, myself perfectly okay, as an old fogie uh, <laughs> irrelevant to this new world but please someone make it happen thank, thank you, you very much amit thank this you, was amit. enjoyable thank you sir and uh, thanks if you enjoyed listening to the show please do go over to the wire.in donate if you can you can follow siddharth on twitter at bombaywala b o m b a y w a l l a h and you can follow peter at zigzagly z i g z a c k l y you can follow me at amit varma a m i t v a r m a you can browse past episodes of the scene and the unseen at sceneunseen.in or thinkpragati.com thank you for listening This is Shiladitya Mukhopadhyay and I'm Amit Doshi and we host Shunya One the weekly podcast based on conversations about startups entrepreneurship across verticals like food tech or fintech and digital payments logistics e-commerce and of course all the stuff from VCs and investors as well over the course of our run we've had some really great entrepreneurs we've had Dishan Hayat from Topper Naya Sagi from Baby Chakra Ankur Sachdev from ShareChat and Akrit from Haptic among many many more Yep and we continue to get some of the biggest smartest and most innovative folks in the country in this space coming here talking to us all for you guys to listen to. So tune in every Tuesday on the IBM app website or wherever you get your podcasts from and get a chance to be a part of all of the tech banter and entrepreneurship conversations on our Slack channel. Talk to our guests they show up as well. All you have to do is request an invite on ibmpodcast.com/shunya1. Every week comes a show. together to tell you about stuff they like a movie a tv show a book and other stuff tune in every monday on the ivm podcast app to ivm likes batman approves this message thank you batman